Um, hello, everyone. Thank you for joining day two of the Python uh, training. Uh, I hope that uh, some of you had trouble yesterday installing uh, Anaconda and getting it to work. I see that there are four people here, Oswald, Angelo, Ali, and Maurice. I hope that you all have uh, Anaconda installed and ready to uh, use. Can I please get uh, some reaction, a thumbs up, or you could unmute your mic and say that you have everything up and running. Um, so we can start that part. Two thumbs up. So Ali and Oswald have uh, Anaconda up and running. Maurice and Angelo. Maurice, okay, perfect. All right, so, um, so as you have already seen uh, in the, Sorry, let me get my screens straight. Um, all right, so um, yesterday we quickly touched on uh, lists. So I'm just gonna briefly summarize because this is one of the items on the agenda for today. We are not going to go into too much details of lists because we've done that in some detail yesterday. But just as a summary, I'm gonna uh, repeat some of the concepts. So a list is a collection of objects. In here, it is a collection of numbers, right? And then obviously comes the part where you put square brackets in front of it to access different elements. We briefly touched on how the indexing starts with the number zero. It goes up to whatever number you put in. So for example, this one has five members, this list. So if you put in the number zero, it will only return 0 0.273. If you return on, uh, if you put in zero to two, it will return the zeroth index and the one index. And even though you have put in the number two, it will not return uh, the second. It will go up to that point, but not include uh, the last one. Uh, then these exercises that have already been uh, linked uh, in the sheet, in the, in the website, uh, just basically talk about how to get different elements and print them out. We did a few examples of this uh, yesterday. Uh, and then we talked about how accessing element, how accessing indices which are outside the uh, range of the list gives you errors like uh, you're trying to access things um, outside of the list. So there are some exercises here which I would recommend that you do when you have time. So uh, for today's session, um, I would like all of you to actually first uh, start your Jupyter no uh, lab. Make sure that you get the um, make sure you get the uh, layout that I have in front of me. I'm going to give you guys like maybe a minute. I'm going to look for a thumbs up uh, to see if everyone has actually gotten to this point. So if you have launched your Jupyter lab, Ali has, uh, then we can um, proceed to the next part. Okay, so Angelo and Maurice, uh, can you please um, give a thumbs up when, okay, so Maurice. Um, if you're having trouble, please unmute your mic and let me know uh, if your computer is just slow and you are in the process of starting up, we can move forward. And uh, or if you think that it's going to take less time, I can wait. Maurice, are you still with us? Okay, yes, Maurice, are you there? Yeah, I'm on Jupiter now. Okay, so you see the screen that I have in front of me, right? Um, not exactly, I just open it, but it doesn't have what you have. So what does it show you? Uh, maybe you can uh, in, share your screen with us if you would be comfortable doing that. 
uh, and I can probably show you. Or if you just want to do it at your own pace, you're hap we're happy to go on and uh, in the break, I can help you uh, catch up. Would that be okay? Oh, yeah, I think that that will be fine. Okay, right. So for the people who actually have this, uh, the first thing we need is that in the left-hand panel, we want to create, uh, uh, we want to have some data, right? So the question is, where do you get this data? So as a part of your setting up, uh, you would have been pointed to uh, a link. And in that link, you can actually get the data. If you do not have the access to that, I'm going to copy the link in the chat right now. Uh, I have sent it out. Oh, okay, so Ken has already done it. Thank you, Ken. So if you just click on this link that Ken has shared, um, uh, it will download a zip file. What I want you guys to do is I want you to open the, uh, unzip the file and put it in the same location where your uh, Anaconda or Jupyter Lab is actually running from. So can I get a thumbs up when people have downloaded? So if you just click on that link, it will download. Uh, it might unzip it itself. Otherwise, just double clicking on it uh, or right clicking and decompressing or extracting should also work. Hi, Asha. Uh, yes. How do, you, how do you know the location where the uh, Jupyter Lab is running? Okay, so there are, I will show you a slightly complicated way. So if you, in this launcher, if you go and open terminal, right? So on the terminal, it will show you the exact path where it is running from. So I have created a folder on my desktop called SWC November 2022. If you don't know where it is, just I think typing PWD will show you the exact path uh, of where things are, where uh, Jupyter Notebook is currently looking at. Does that help, Ali? Yes, it does. Thank you so much. So uh, you can actually use this command prompt to move data around, or you can actually manually copy paste it to that location. Uh, once you have it in the right location, you will see that the data folder will appear in the left-hand panel. Okay, cool. If Let's see. If, uh, if everything has worked, uh, the data uh, folder should appear in the left hand uh, panel. So uh, can I get everyone to uh, make sure that uh, the data folder appears in this left hand panel? Angelo, Ali, are you, have you solved it? Were you able to move? I'm still copying, but okay, let me see. Okay, more uh, Maurice. Um, have things started working? Okay, I or... think I ha I have it. A perfect, have it. perfect. All right. Yeah. Okay, so once you have this uh, data in here, do not double click it because if you double click it, it will go inside, and then your code will be running somewhere else. So just make sure that it says data and it does not, it should not say data.zip. It should just be data. It should be after you have unzipped it that you want to move it uh, to this particular uh, location. All right. So uh, I'm guessing we're all good up till here. Uh, what we want to do now is we want to um, start our notebook. You can start a new notebook. You can load the previous one. It should not matter. Uh, what you can do is just double click on, single click on this icon. It will create a new notebook. And that new notebook will show right underneath uh, the data folder, which means that it is exactly the same uh, location. 
If you want to change the name of this, please go ahead and do it. If you don't want to change it, that is also uh, fine. All right. So now, um, before we actually proceed with the first part of this, uh, the first thing I want to remind you is yesterday we worked with something called libraries. So libraries are a collection of functions or methods or instances where you can import pre-existing code somebody else has written in the form of a function and use it. So you don't have to write a lot of code. Uh, you use somebody else's code to actually do it, right? So yesterday we were looking at the library called import math, right? And then using the function math dot, not function, uh, using math dot pi, if I run this, I get the value of pi. Right. So just like uh, import math and using math.py, I have another library called import pandas. Okay. So if I import this library called pandas, it will give me a collection of functions. Now, people who are beginning, I got this question yesterday as well. Um, that uh, what are the functions and how do you know that? How do you know which functions are there, right? So uh, what I would like to show to you is that you can actually go to uh, the Pandas uh, library um, uh, website and actually look at uh, the user guide. Now the user guide will be quite detailed. It will give you a lot of working examples. We are going to go through some of this. I'm going to show you very basic functionality on how to access data, how to, uh, how to import data so that you can analyze it and how to export uh, data and uh, in some in-between processes, right? I we obviously we don't have time to go through all of these, but the reason why I'm showing you this is because uh, I got a question yesterday about uh, which functions are available, and those you can get from this uh, guide. Okay, so having said that, I want to introduce you to a concept called aliasing, right? So what does that mean? So if I okay, let's go back to the example of import math. Right. So if I do import math, every time I have to use the uh, function inside this library or any recover any value from it, I have to type the name of the library followed by the value itself. Right. So aliasing, what it does is it allows you to reduce the size of the name of the library. So, for example, I can say import math as M. So what will happen is that the library name math is now the same as the letter M. So what I can do is I can just type m.py and it will give me the same. So in case of math, probably this is not a good idea because the library name is already very small, right? You don't want to uh, alias it, but sometimes you have very large libraries, which we will, some of it we will look at, uh, today and then it is helpful to use the as command uh, and then put a short character in front of it. Um, one thing that I would like to remind you is that now the character M has been reserved for this library. If I down here say M equals two and then if I say M dot pi, it will give me an error because I had mounted my math library onto the uh, onto the character M, but here I reassigned a new value to the character. And now this same function that was the same value that I was able to recover here, I am unable to do it here because now it is telling me that int object has no attribute pi because M equals two puts the integer two in the variable M. If I now run this command again, now you will notice that this number was eight, this number is nine. So this cell has been run now. And then if I come down here and run this again, I will get the value back. But if I do M equals two or 29 or whatever, and then if I run this, I will get the error. So remember 
that if you are going to alias a library to a character, make sure that that is justified. Make sure that you do not overwrite uh, the variable like I did using m equals 29. Okay. So going to take a one minute break. I want to uh, get four thumbs up uh, to make sure that uh, everyone has understood what is happening. And in today's session, I would like you to actually type the code and uh, do it uh, uh, alongside as I'm going. So make sure that uh, uh, you actually uh, do like uh, follow along as um, I'm doing it. So if you have already installed uh, Anaconda and if you have this open in front of you, please follow along as it will help us, uh, help you guys understand uh, this better. Okay, so uh, has everyone caught up till now? Uh, the only thing that I've done up till now is that we have opened the Jupyter Notebook or uh, Jupyter Lab. We have uh, created this data set by downloading it from the link in the chat. Uh, you unzip the data, then you put it in this location. So on the left-hand panel, it appears as this folder. Once it does that, you started a new notebook. And in that notebook, I have introduced the concept of aliasing large library names to short uh, characters, right? And I've explained that, uh, why do you want to do it? Because sometimes the library names are quite large and you don't want to write every time you want to use a function, you will have to write the whole name, right? So by aliasing it to a smaller chunk of characters, you can avoid repeating the larger, um, the larger name. So can I get a thumbs up from the people who have been following along that everything is okay? And uh, if you want me to explain something, uh, please uh, uh, unmute yourself or raise your hand uh, if you have questions, if you do not have questions, just press a thumbs up and we will go on. So Oswald, perfect. Maurice, I think you're still struggling or have you caught up? All right, so I'm gonna catch up with Maurice uh, during the break. So let's uh, go to uh, using pandas right so import pandas and obviously uh, this is uh, a relative I, will, I wouldn't say this is a large library name but i will still alias it to pd now you might see a lot of code where people have started using the same alias it does not matter what you're aliasing it to right it could be pan as well but for the rest of the code whatever you're aliasing it here has to remain the same so if you choose to do it as PD, all the functions that we will get out of it needs to be starting with PD. If you choose to do it with PAM, then all the functions need to uh, proceed uh, with PAM. Okay, so I'm just gonna clear this off. Uh, and if everything works, when you run this command in this cell by clicking, pressing shift and enter key, uh, you will get a number and no errors will appear. This means that the library is already available. Now, yesterday I took, gave you examples of differences between Anaconda and Miniconda. So if you install Miniconda, Miniconda will not come with pandas. So if you install Miniconda and then try running this command, it will show you package not found or uh, uh, something, something along those lines, right? So, if you install Anaconda, then this library will already be there and you should be able to start uh, using it uh, out of the box. Okay, so having said that, uh, let's go and see what is the function that we can use to actually uh, import our data uh, and have a play with it as to uh, what it is. Okay, so now what we're gonna do is uh, we are going to use a function so pandas, the library is now aliased with uh, PD. So if I put a dot here and press tab, it will show me this drop down menu. This already gives me a rough idea as to what are the things. Uh, 
Um, so if you if you press the dot and then press tab, you can actually uh, see what are some of the methods or instances or uh, classes that are available in that, right? So we are right now going to use read CSV function. Now, just to give you an idea, what is CSV, right? So for people who have been dealing with data, you guys will know that uh, the uh, or CSV is a common format in which data is saved in files, right? So can someone tell me what CSV stands for? Ali, Maurice, Roberts, Zire. Anyone? What is a CSV file? What does it look like? Does anyone know? I know when uh, you open the data, it has commas separation. So they are separated by comma yes. or cell. Oh, yeah. Yes, that is that is absolutely correct. So if you have a file, imagine a table, but the, a table when it is saved in a text file, you won't get clear separation between rows and columns, right? But what happens is that every column in that file will have a separation uh, of commas, right? This is a standard. You can have anything as a separator, but people commonly use tabs and commas, right? So that is why two functions are commonly available, a TSV and a CSV, right? Today, we're going to be using the read uh, CSV uh, function. And now what I will do is I will open the round brackets and I will, so if the data folder is appearing right here, putting data, sorry, inverted commas, and then data, and then pressing the tab key will automatically show you the name of all of the files that are present in uh, data, right? So we are going to choose uh, the Oceania, uh, file. It doesn't matter which one you choose, but I just want to, because we have a preset example of uh, the GDP data for Oceania. Uh, I'm going to use this. Okay. So now that this command is complete, you have given it a CSV file to read. If I press shift enter, it will give you a very nicely formatted uh, something on the output. Right. We don't right now. We don't care about uh, the contents. Uh, I just want to explain to you what CSV is actually uh, doing. Now, why do you want to use pandas and this particular function? The reason is that the pandas library has recently become very popular for people who have been analyzing data for a very long time. Right. So it it already does a lot of things for you that typical data analysts tend to do. Like for example, uh, you want to have a nicely formatted table. As opposed to this, I, I can have another, uh, just to give you an idea, the NumPy library also has a function. Um, so we're not gonna use uh, from text. Data gap minder machine, right? In this command, because I'm just generating it from text, I will have to specify my delimiter and I will have to say uh, as this. So when I load, when I run it like this, you will notice that a lot of uh, values appear as NAN, right? And then somewhere down here, you also have NAN. So the reason is that the NumPy library is very raw. It is a very raw function to import data into, uh, uh, into your uh, working environment. Pandas actually takes care of a lot of things. So for example, in this command, now I will have to specify that the data type is a string. So when I do this, now you will notice that those values which were previously showing up as NAN have now been recovered. The reason why this happens is because NumPy is designed for only numbers. If you choose to not specify D type STR, then it will try to read the entire data file as if it were only on numbers. 
and obviously country name or country itself cannot be converted into a number so it just replaces it with a not any number or n a n so and even right now it does sorry, not Asha. look at yes sorry sir uh, yeah i think uh, i think i have uh, a problem so i myself when i downloaded the data Mm -hmm. The folder I got is gap. It is called the gap. No Python, no PC. Yeah, yeah. So did you gap. unzip it? Did, did you double yes, click on it? Yes, it, it is unzipped. You know, I did not double click on it. So can you please right click on it and select a fun, uh, select <laughs> the option extract or decompress? I don't know what it will show in Windows. No, I, I, but... It is unzipped. I'm using uh, Linux, so it is unzipped. And, so when uh, you unzip, when you unzip it, it should automatically become the folder data. No, it is it is the same, but the the extension is different. Okay, let me check where it, it is in my home. Okay, Python. So let me see I what, can do it. So okay, maybe let me let me just. Put in the in the chat the name the full name. So let me let me download it again for you to show you um, how it would look. So okay. Uh, if we go that is, in the chat, that is my, the name of my my folder. Okay, so let me just show you what would have happened. So I'm just gonna create a directory here. Okay. Uh, uh, T. So, so currently you see that the directory T is empty, right? Yes. So if I use W get and the name of the file, it will download it, and then it will appear like this. Yes. Okay? Python. Yes. So on Windows, what should happen is um, that if I now do open dot, uh, you will notice that this file. Is a zip file. If I double click this, it creates this data folder. And in, 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 data in okay, how do you do it in a in a Ubuntu? So I think you should just right click, and um, there should be an option to uh, get it out. So people in the chat are uh, suggesting that. Uh, is there so inside the gapminder folder that you have do you have one folder or do you have many files there are many files okay let me see, so let me see. so okay i have actually they are built built class they they lot okay a lot of things import maybe let me see if they, if i can see that so uh okay yes there so, is also that Yes. So what you want to do is just copy the data folder to that location, not the entire, because if you copy the entire one, then there is no problem. All you have to do is to put the entire folder name before data. So whatever okay. you let, had, Python, let, novice. Let, let, let me copy the data and put it in my location. Okay, now I think it is good. So it was actually, it was inside, the, the, the folder was inside my... Yeah, I think it's just an operating system to operating system difference, but it okay. uh, doesn't really matter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I, it is sorted. Let me see if it is working. Do you have it? Ali, is it working for you? Oh, I was muted. So it is working. Yes, I, I see now. Perfect. All right. Okay. So thank you. Uh, okay. No worries. Uh, so we were. Uh, so I was explaining 
that uh, why do we need pandas, right? So when we use NumPy, NumPy will also give you a function to bring the data into Python, but it does not look as good as this nice layout. Uh, so when people are doing data analysis, they want uh, not they want to look at the data and they want to analyze the data, right? So if you're looking at the data in a layout that looks like this as the pandas output, it is more user friendly. If you are looking at the data like this, if you are a hardcore uh, hardcore like uh, a programmer, you might still be able to make sense of it. But for most uh, people, this is not very user friendly. Right. So the reason why this is one of the reasons why pandas became more uh, popular. Another thing is that pandas give you easy access. So, for example, um, in pandas, I can actually get one complete row and I can get one complete column out, which I will show you in a few seconds. If you generate this using NumPy, you have to first convert the data into a special format before you can get one column out. Right. Otherwise, it is not a simple task to just get one column out of a NumPy uh, array. R row, each row you can get, but then you have to sub index and get the column. So it becomes quite uh, difficult. Right. And pandas has removed that problem. And I will show you uh, how that works. Right. So I'm just going to, I just wanted to show you this comparison. So I'm going to remove these two cells. Uh, okay. So now we have imported the data. Uh, using the library, but we did not mount it onto a variable. So I'm just going to put data here. It will not display the output. So to get the output, I actually just need uh, to put data here or do print uh, data. Right. So if I do print data, it does not give me that layout, but it still prints uh, it out nicely. Um, if I do it just without that, there is some formatting that goes in and it uh, nicely renders it as a um, as a table. All right. So, uh, okay, so that was step one, right? So what has happened up till now is we have used a library called pandas and we have used a function called read CSV uh, to import our comma separated file holding all of our data into uh, Python and mounted it onto the variable called uh, data. All right. I hope uh, there are no problems up till here because this was fairly, well, this was relatively simple uh, stuff. Okay. All right. So now what we're going to do is we are going to look at this data for a few seconds. Um, let me just explain. Uh, Oceania refers to two uh, particular uh, geographical territories of Australia and New Zealand. You have other data files here which refer to other uh, countries, but because the example has been prepared using this data, I am going to go ahead and use this. Um, you In the first column, you have country names, Australia and New Zealand. Um, each row gets the number. Uh, again, with Python indexing, you get the first one as zero and the second one is one. And then each subsequent column is the GDP of that country in a particular year. So GDP uh, per capita, 1952, all the way down to 2007. All right. So um, so this is what the, what, what the data is that we have just uh, imported. All right. Uh, I hope there are no questions. We have all understood what, uh, what it looks like. So now we, we realize that, Hey, uh, our uh, rows are numbered as zero and one, but maybe as a data analyst, you don't want that. Maybe you want the row identifier, not to be a numeric. You want it to be uh, the country name directly. So what you will do is you will repeat the command that we did up here. I'm just going to copy paste it down here. But this time you will put a comma here and you will say that I want the index column by uh, C O U N T R Y. Okay. 
So when I run this command and then I see data, you will notice that the zero one have now disappeared. And instead of zero and one being the identifier of each of the rows, Australia and New Zealand, these actual English words uh, have become the identifiers. Okay, does that make sense? Can I get a few thumbs up that everything is okay up till now? Ellie Oswald, Maurice. All right, I got one thumbs up. Maurice, Ali, are you guys following along? Any? Okay. So, uh, okay, so that's uh, one thing and everybody does this. So you don't actually have to do the last command that I did, right? As a data analyst, it is your preference how you want your code to be structured. You can choose to use NumPy and not use pandas at all, or you can use to have pandas and then restructure your data uh, into a format that is more convenient for you to write your uh, code, all right? Okay, so uh, yesterday, uh, okay, now I'm gonna spend like two minutes or three minutes maybe on talking about data structures like we talked yesterday. So yesterday I introduced data structures. We saw the simplest data structure A equals two. Think of it as a scalar. Then we talked about uh, uh, list. And I told you that in the list, I already showed you that you can actually index different things, right? And then I told you that there are a lot of other different kinds of data structures, right? So uh, when pandas actually imports data, the imported data becomes a data frame, okay? So the data frame can actually be thought of as a data structure, right? Uh, so now what we're gonna do is we're going to explore uh, this data structure a bit using built-in functions, okay? So the first thing we want to do is just use something called info, right? So if I do data, which actually holds my data, and if I put, uh, in, sorry, if I put, sorry, if I put info uh, after that, and if I hit enter, it will display an output for me. Sorry, hold on. Uh, so you've gotten to this output, right? Uh, can I get a thumbs up to uh, see if everybody get, has gotten up to this point? So when you do data.info, you see this table, right? Um, this table gives you a very quick summary of uh, what the content of your data. It is not a meaningful summary, uh, but it is a, uh, it gives you some information, right? So the first thing we see is that all of these column titles have been laid out in this column. It shows data number zero to 11, which tells me that there are 12 columns here. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, and 12. So going from 1952 to 2007, there are 12 columns. Those 12 columns are written here. So this exact entry represents the column uh, title or the column header or the column label, right? Uh, so uh, then it will tell you that are all of the entries in that full or not, right? So right now it just gives you a rough idea that two non-null entries, right? So sometimes what might happen is that uh, if, when you work with real-time data, there are always going to be missing data values. So somebody maybe so maybe in 1957, because of whatever reason, they might not have calculated the GDP for Australia, in which case this entry would have been blank, right? So uh, this summary is useful to get an idea whether there are missing values, for instance, in your uh, data set or not. The third column actually lists uh, uh, D type, right? Uh, the data type actually tells you, uh, again, we uh, saw yesterday that there's a data type called integer. We talked about a data type called floats. So when you have a number being expressed as a decimal, it is called a floating point number. And you notice that all of these are floating point numbers and hence all of them are called 
floats. You can ignore uh, 64 after this because that refers to the precision and we're not going to go into uh, too much details uh, on that right now. All right. Uh, and then it also prints out uh, how much. So when you import the data from the CSV file, so when it was in the CSV file, it was sitting on your hard drive. Then you use the command read CSV. It has opened that file, imported that data, and it is now holding it in your Jupyter Lab setup. So your Jupyter Lab setup is actually being held in your RAM, right? So uh, this is actually telling you how much memory uh, is this data set actually using. So for our purposes, this memory might not be very uh, useful, but remember that when you are working with very, very, very large data sets, you may uh, run out of memory very fast, right? So this gives you a rough idea if you want to manage or optimize your code. So maybe it does not import the entire file in one go. Maybe it imports only the top 1000 rows, or maybe it only imports the bottom 1000 rows, depending on what you need uh, out of the data. And that can help you with, for example, I mean, this is a very bad example, but it is an example nonetheless that if you are running out of memory, you maybe do not need to process the whole data. You can process it in parts, right? Or in parts that can be held in your uh, memory. So are we all good? Uh, do we understand what is happening? Can I get a thumbs up? Ali, Maurice, Zire, Oswald, is everything going okay? Perfect. Fast response. I like that. Uh, all right, so let's try out a new command. So just like this, uh, we can also have the command called data. Dot, actually, I'm just gonna uh, do it here. So I'm gonna cut this and do data dot columns. So if I do data dot columns, it will just return a list, and that list will have uh, one entry for each of the column headers, right? Uh, nothing fancy about that. All right, so now another thing that can be done is that uh, you can actually flip the data uh, around, right? So that's called taking the transpose. So taking the transpose just does this. So previously we had two rows and we had 12 columns. Now by flipping it, we have 12 rows and we have two columns, right? So uh, holding the data, I mean, these are the headers, so we don't count this as column. Uh, we're going to count this and this as uh, potential columns. All right. So uh, again, if you were doing this using NumPy, it would take you a lot of code and a lot of understanding of your data to create a layout like this. But with pandas, you can just press uh, one key and uh, get it. All right. So I hope there are no questions uh, up till now. Uh, can I at least get a thumbs up for the people that are actually doing this with me? Because if you guys are doing it with me, um, um, and that is very good. And then I can keep going at this pace. But if you guys are just here uh, listening, uh, then I can probably speed up a little. Okay, Oswald is doing it, so I will keep this space uh, as is. Uh, Ellie, thank you. Um, okay, so now just like the data dot t function, uh, there is another uh, thing called data dot describe. So previously we used a function called um, uh, info. So info also gave us some information about the data about the data frame. Uh, describe actually gives a different kind of information. And what it basically does is that for people who do statistics, uh, this might look familiar. Uh, it prints out some key statistics from your data, right? So the first uh, row gives you the count or how many points do you have in that uh, data? So each column has uh, two entries, right? One for Australia and one for New Zealand. So the count column for each of the years is just going to be the number two. Then comes uh, mean. So how do you take the mean? You take the mean by uh, adding the numbers together and dividing them by uh, two. 
right? So just to show you an idea, the mean for 1952, uh, now this is a weird way. Why would you want to mean the Australia and New Zealand together? But just for the sake, here it doesn't make much sense. But uh, if I just take this number, for example, and if I take this number, for example, and if I divide it by two, I will get the number 102980.0, which is exactly uh, this number. Now, it would make sense to take this, the mean of this because the file that we imported was labeled as Oceania. So it is counting both of the countries as one geographical group. So the mean is actually meaningful to calculate. Okay. So just like that, you can calculate the standard deviation. There's a formula for that. We're not going to use it here. Uh, then you can, uh, between these two, uh, what is the minimum value? And the minimum value will be exactly this. What is the maximum value, which is going to be exactly this. And then based on this mean and this standard deviation, you can calculate 25%, 50%, and 75% along the way. All right. So, uh, uh, these are just like, uh, I think they're called quartile ranges. Um, but we're not gonna, again, we're not going to go into the details of this. The purpose of this describe command is to actually get some statistics um, of your data. They might be meaningful. They might not be. It depends on what data you're uh, having and uh, or what uh, things you will uh, be getting out of, uh, out of it, right? Okay, so now uh, we are going to do one exercise and that exercise looks like this, right? So what I want you to do is that currently we opened the file uh, called gapminder.gdpoceania.csv. I want you to make changes to that command so that instead of reading Oceania data, it reads the gapminder gdp americas.csv. And I will give like a one minute pause here or two minute pause and people can uh, try doing this. And give me a thumbs up when you've done it. So Oswald and Ali, you reacted that you were actually carrying out this uh, alongside. If you're having trouble, please unmute your mic and ask, and I will uh, help you through. Can I get a thumbs up when people have actually done it? Okay, Ali, I'm glad that you were able to read in the data. Oswald, are you still with us? Are you doing it, Maurice? Zire? Yes, no. If you're having trouble, please unmute and ask. And uh... all right. Okay, so. Uh... Uh, if I just show you the solution here, um, all you had to do was to change the name in this from that to this, right? And then do americas.describe or uh, like depending on if you choose data here or and then you can do data.describe if you're using americas as a variable name, then you can uh, use that, all right? So now the next exercise is about uh, after reading the data for Americas, use the help function, right? Uh, uh, and help uh, Americas.tail to find out the data frame head and the data frame tail, right? So these are the functions that are already given to you. And what the head function does is it will print out the head of the file. And what the tail function will do is it will print out the tail. So what do I mean by head and what do I mean by tail is that if the file has, let's say 1000 rows, then the head would constitute 5, 10, 15, 20 rows. 
and the tail will constitute 5, 10, 15 rows. So if you do uh, America's dot tail, it will only print out the bottom few lines. And if you do America's dot head, it will only print out the top few lines. If you did not change the variable name to Americas and you chose to do it with data, then uh, you have to do data dot head and data dot uh, tail. So can I please get a thumbs up? Have people been able to do the data dot head or data dot tail? Okay, so I'm just gonna quickly do this uh, as well. So the idea now is that instead of having the gap finder Oceania data, we are going to go with gap minder uh, Americas. Then we are going to print it out. So now if I print out this data, what will happen is that you will notice that there are 24 uh, rows. All right. So then I'm going to put in the index column so that these numbers in the first become replaced with the uh, with the uh, uh, with the country label, and then if I oh sorry my bad okay so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna copy this cut it from here so that we can reduce the jargon go up here do this and this. Right, so now you will see that the uh, numbers um, here have been replaced by the actual country names. Now, if I do, so notice how there are many rows. So if I do data dot head. Uh, wait, sorry, hold on. Um, So uh, if you do data dot head, it will print out uh, uh, all the rows, right? But in, in if you want uh, a first certain set of rows, you will do three, okay? So when you do this, uh, you will notice that it only prints out the top three uh, rows. And if you replace the word head with tail, uh, it will print out the last three, uh, the last three rows. Okay. Now, interestingly, what you can do is uh, uh, the same thing that you did over there. Uh, you can uh, with the with the dot t, you can actually apply it to this. So it will take the entire data it will take the last three entries and only the last three entries will get flipped or be taken a transpose uh, off, okay? So you can start to group things together now. So instead of writing it out, sending it to a new variable name, you can directly do it uh, there. All right? Does anybody have any questions up till now? Or is everything uh, clear? Okay, so uh, as a part of what we have just done now, I'm just going to quickly summarize before we take a 10 minute break. Uh, what we have done right now is that we have downloaded a data set from a, from a website and we have uh, unzipped it and put it in our working directory, right? That is right here data. We then started a notebook and I introduced you to the pandas library. Right In the pandas library, we also learned about aliasing, which is that you can, instead of having to write panda, panda, panda every time when you're using a pandas function, um, you can actually shorthand it to pd. So this is called aliasing and we've done it uh, here, right? Uh, then I told you how to read in one file using, because we already know our data, right? So in the data folder, if you uh, go and look at it, you will already see that there are CSV files. If they are actual CSV files, then you should be able to use dot read uh, underscore CSV function available in pandas to actually read in that uh, file. Uh, then we noticed that there were numbers appearing on the left-hand panel and we wanted to uh, replace those numbers 
uh, with uh, the country labels, right? So we chose to use uh, comma index underscore colon uh, each country with uh, the country. Then we looked at the function called uh, info and also describe. And what describes does is it actually takes uh, each column and gives statistics. So how many values are there? What is the mean standard dev? minimum, maximum, and the what our ranges, right? So then we uh, talked about the command, uh, follow this up with the method dot T. And if I run this, what will happen is that uh, uh, it will get flipped. So whatever is in the rows will become columns and whatever is in the columns will become rows. So if I remove this, you will notice uh, that the year headers are at the top and the statistics are on the left hand side in the rows. If I do dot T, it is just going to switch the order. And now the years are on the left hand side and the statistics are on the top. Okay. So this ends um, the first exercise, which is importing data um, and uh, having a play with it, like looking at, looking at it, uh, describing it, manipulating it. Right now, we have not done anything to the data itself, right? We have just opened the file. We have seen using info uh, if there are any missing values, right? If there are no missing values, then everything is fine. We have seen the describe function, which actually talks about um, uh, how the data is shaped or structured. And uh, so that was uh, that. So at this point, we are going to take maybe a 10 minute, 15 minute break. So are you guys saturated? Can you handle more? Then we can do a quick 10 minute break. If you guys want a longer break, uh, we can do, so maybe put in the chat what you want. Do you want a 10 minute break, 15 minute, 20 minute? Okay, maybe not 20 minutes because we do want to finish this. So uh, is 10 minute break enough? 15 minute break enough? I want to see somebody type in the chat or unmute yourself and uh, don't be shy. Come on. Okay. I guess nobody wants to answer that. Okay. So we'll take a 15 minute break. Uh, on my end, it is currently 342. Uh, let's try and or did Maurice say 15, 10 minutes? I'm sorry, I can't hear anyone. Oh, in private chat. Oh, okay, okay, that, that makes sense. Okay, so we got a one response of 10 minutes. Um, we can break for 10 minutes and uh, it's 3.42 at my end. So uh, at 3.53 in 10 minutes, uh, we will uh, resume our session from here, all right? So I will see you all in 10 minutes. Uh, Nikita, if you want to pause the recording. Uh... Okay. Um, I'll get to the next part where we, what we're gonna do now is we are going to explore some more uh, functions within pandas, right? So let me just quickly uh, go back uh, to another file uh, just so that I can follow along with the examples. What I would want you all to do is that I would want you all who are actually following along to, um, use the europe.csv file uh, for this next part. We are going to uh, work with this. So can everyone please take uh, a few seconds to change the name of the file uh, so that it has the word Europe in it instead of Oceania or the Americas. Um,
So, is uh, are we good? Uh, as I'm, I'm hoping that everyone has loaded this into uh, into Python. So, uh, for this part, I would like you like to remind you of how you were indexing lists. Okay, so when you were indexing lists, what you were doing was that you actually saw a very small list. Uh, you saw that it had four members. So the first member had uh, the index zero, then one, two, and three, right? So the same concept applies to what we are going to uh, do now, in uh, just with one slight change. And that change is that uh, we have a table, right? So if we take one row of that table, that row will be one list, correct? But because we have multiple rows, we can have, uh, think of it as a matrix, right? So uh, in a matrix, each uh, value has a row and a column number. So I can ask you to give me what is the entry in the third row, fourth column of a particular matrix. And uh, then you can obviously use the number three and the number four as indices, or two and three actually, and uh, give me that value, right? So just like that, we are going to think of this table as a matrix that we have just brought in. It's not actually a matrix. A matrix is a different kind of data structure, but for the ease of understanding, I want you to think of it as a mathematical uh, matrix or a table, a 2D uh, a ta a table, right? Uh, so what we're going to do is we are going to use the command called uh, iLock, right? So uh, the iLock command, uh, uh, the iLock command would actually receive arguments in the term of, oh, sorry. Uh, in the term of, uh, actually, let me first print out uh, data. So you notice that the first value um, is 1601.56136, okay? Let's just say that I want only this value. So now recalling what we did yesterday and slightly today in the beginning with lists, uh, I want to get the first uh, value. So can someone remind me uh, actually, no, uh, we know that the first index is the index zero, right? So because this is a 2D, we need to specify both a row number and a column number. So the iLock command will actually help us do this. If we just do zero, sorry, is someone saying something? Does anybody have a question? Maurice, uh, you're unmuted, I think. Uh, uh, did, you, did you have a question? No, I don't have a question. All right, okay. So um, iLock actually uh, allows you to input two uh, uh, numbers, right? And these numbers refer to the rows and columns. So if I do uh, this only, you will notice that you will get the first entry, which I was just reading out, right? Just to highlight to that, um, 1601 is the, is present on the zeroth row and the zeroth column, right? Now, can someone tell me that if I want to get the value 1942.284, what do I need to write uh, here? So 00 got 1601, I want 1942. So what do I do? Come on, Oswald, Zire, Raymond, Ali, can someone tell me? Zero Sorry, one. say it again. Zero zero one. One. So what will this return? 1942? That is correct. Right? What if I want uh, 1090 or 10991, this value? Right? So what will I write? Three. Two, three. Two. Why two? Why three? Two, 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 two. Yes. Okay, so I will write two, two here, uh, two and two, and I get 10991.20676, all right? 
so let's do a different one this time so up till now it was uh, they were all easy right so what if i want uh, this one 14800 so who's going to count now is somebody going to count no obviously not so we're going to be smart about this so what we are going to know is that we are looking at the GDP for the year 1977. And we are looking at the country Czech Republic. Okay. So now we're going to slightly modify our command. So instead of having data I lock, I'm going to use data LOC or data lock. And instead of giving it numbers, I am going to type C here and press tab. Oh, it did not autocomplete. Sorry, my bad. So now I have to uh, type in. Uh, okay, maybe that was a bad idea. So this is too long a word. Let's go with Albania. So if I type in Albania here, uh, and then if I type 1962 here, GDP, uh, actually, I'm just going to copy paste it from here and put it here and do this, right? So what number do I get? I get the number 2312.88958, right? So what I wanted to show you with that example was that if you type the name of the country, which is an identifier of the row, you all obviously have the mathematical number as an identifier as well, the zero zero that you were entering, right? But sometimes you do not have the patience to count the uh, row number and to count the column number. So then it is easy to just do this. Now, why is this possible? This is possible because remember that pandas is designed for data analysis, right? And a lot of time people who are analyzing data, they are working with files that are structured like this. And to get easy access to data, pandas provides functionality which can allow you to do this in one command. If you were doing this using uh, NumPy, for example, you would have to write some code. Oswald, yes, you have a question. Yeah, I'm just wanting to know what will happen if, for instance, if you put uh, Albania and then here yeah, instead of writing the name of the column, just specify the, the, the number of column. Uh, sorry, do you mean like uh, this? Yes. Mm, something weird will happen. So in the end, uh, so basically what is happening is that uh, you're mixing two commands. So the numbers are taken by the I lock command, right? So the I lock uh, takes in numbers, but the LOC method takes in identifiers of the columns and identifiers of the rows, right? So the identifier of the row is zero as well, but that will work with I lock and lock will take the name of the uh, row and the name of the uh, like this. Did that make sense? Did I answer your question? Yes. Perfect. All right. So I think we're clear uh, about this. So let's uh, try to do something that Oswald suggested, but do it slightly differently. Remember that yesterday when we were talking about uh, accessing uh, elements from a list, we had two ways. One way was to actually specify the exact number. Uh, and the other one was to specify a range. And to specify a range, we use the semicolon, or to, we use the column, not the semicolon, okay? So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to replace this one column header with this. So this does not take in numbers. It takes in uh, that for Austria, give me all rows. Sorry. Yes. Give me all columns. My bad. So um, Austria is here. The first value would be 6137. The second one will be 8842, 10750. And then all the way to the end, the last value will be 36126, which is written here, right? So again, 
there is some functionality which has been ported over from standard uh, indexing. But remember that uh, this command lock and I lock will do the same thing. So Austria is currently on which index in this list? Can some obviously index in this table? Can someone tell me? If I want Austria, but I don't want to give the name, I want to use a mathematical number with the command I lock, what should I write here? Oswald, Ali, Zire, one. Raymond. I, I should write, write one. one. That, yes, that is correct. So if I do this, I will get the exact same uh, output, right? So it will grab the first, uh, not the first, the second row, which has the index one, and it will print out all columns um, uh, in that. All right. I hope that that's uh, all right. That's clear. So obviously you can play around with this in many ways. Let's suppose that I want to do transpose of this. Well, actually in this case, it won't work because uh, you only have these two fields. They're not structured, but if you would have saved it and then would have run the dot T, you would have gotten the transpose. Uh, I am actually not sure why you would want the transpose because uh, I, I really don't use pandas in my work. I work with NumPy, but I'm sure that uh, there might be a case somewhere out there where you might need the, uh, you might need the transpose function. All right. So, uh, yeah. So now what we are going to do is we are going to, Okay, I'm first going to check uh, whether everybody is understood. So can I please get a thumbs up before I proceed to uh, the next part, which is giving getting more complicated with the uh, with the indexing. So can I get a thumbs up, please? Just to add something, uh, if you add a number using this dialog next to the, the semicolon, it will list, if, for example, if you add two, you just uh, give, give two entries after. Like this? Yeah. So, it, so, so it went into Austria and then it started at column two and only printed out one value because it will go up till three, but not include three. Yes. Does that make sense? Is that what you wanted to see? Yes, I did run that. I'm just uh, adding it just in case somebody didn't notice. It. Ah, okay, 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 okay. Right, right. Yes, yes. So uh, obviously, and then the same thing you can do in I lock uh, in lock as well, right? So remember that lock takes in. Uh, okay, let's for quick reference. Let's look at data again. So data starts with Albania and goes all the way to uh, the UK. Okay. So let's suppose that I want only Belgium to Bulgaria. Okay, what will I do? I will go to lock. I will come here. I will do Bulgaria. I will do, uh, what was it? No, Belgium to Bulgaria. So I'm just gonna do this. Uh, So Belgium to Bulgaria, and uh, what I want is to have everything on the other side. So now you will notice that you have subsectioned your table to only display uh, that. Now, if I let's suppose I only want 1957 to 1962. So what I will do is I will just copy this here, put it here and then do this and then change this to 1952. No, let's do 67, 67. Okay, now notice that there is a slight difference that is happening here. When you do indexing in lists, it does not include the last one. Here, even though we specified uh, the last one as 1967, it actually did include that. But that is a functionality of this function because this is accessing it as lists, but it is not adhering to the same principles. So when you're accessing lists, 
you specify two colon four, it will only give you two and three. It will go up to four, but not include four. When you are specifying the uh, labels like this, it will include both the first and the last, right? First and the last. Does that make sense? Is everybody good with this? Any questions? All right, so uh, let's just quickly summarize. What have we done up till now? So we imported a data set. We then wanted to index or slice out only some contents of these things of the table. So I, I introduced you to two commands. One is iLock, not commands, more like methods, but like iLock and lock. So iLock specifically, specifically takes, just like you are specifying in indices, it takes mathematical numbers. It cannot be floating points. It has to be an integer because obviously you cannot have 0 0.2 to 4 because there is nothing between 0 and 1, right? So it will throw an error. You have to have integers and uh, then go from 1 uh, up to the second one. And uh, uh, if you use lock command, then you can actually use the row and the column identifiers. Okay. So this is what we have done up till now. I showed you some different com combinations of these to slice out different uh, data. Uh, can I quickly check with you if uh, you are actually doing it along with me so that I can give you an exercise. If you're not doing, then I will just uh, skip the exercise part, leave that for you to do at home and uh, we will proceed. So thumbs up for people who are actually doing it in Jupyter Notebook. Okay. So let's quickly look at uh, some exercises, right? So you notice that in this table, there are mathematical numbers, right? So what if there is a need to only find out those values which have which meet a certain criteria right so what will happen is that you can actually uh here so in this case i have subset i'm only looking at 1957 62 and 67 and i'm only looking at belgium bosnia and bulgaria right so what i can do is that I can directly specify, uh, yeah. So I can specify values that are greater than uh, or smaller than. So let's try smaller than first. So this number is close to 10,000. The, okay. So I want to see values that are smaller than uh, 2000, but I'm not going to run this command here. I'm going to copy it and I'm gonna run it here, right? So you will notice that the same data structure becomes false and true. So it will become true for those values where this criteria is met. So you will notice that it is showing me two true values. So 1353 is smaller than 2000. 1709 is smaller than 2000. The rest of the entries are greater than 2000. So they do not follow this criteria. Hence they become false. Does that make sense? Did everybody understand what just happened? Any questions? Okay. So now, uh, maybe, maybe, just maybe, you may want to uh, look at the true values or you may want to, yeah, you may want to look at the true values. So if you want to look at the true values, I am going to save this entire output into uh, a variable called V, for example, it's my choice, I can call it whatever. Um, and then what I will do is, actually I'm just gonna run this uh, in a new one so that, Okay, so if I look at V now, 
So what is V? V is exactly this. And what I can do is that I can pass it to pass it back to uh, actually okay small small problem. So I can now uh, if I want to look at the values here, what I was going to do, which I realized was that I can do this. So the data holds the total table, right? And V is actually location of only those values which meet this criteria. So if I run this, for example, um, I will get uh, uh, those values where it is true and everywhere else it will be uh, dropped. Okay. But I did not want to see the entire table. I wanted to see only values in this subset, but I never saved this subset. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to call this W, save this dub subset, and then instead of doing data, I'm only going to do this. And now you notice that instead of displaying the entire table, it only displays uh, the subset that we collected. And this mask or this uh, uh, array, Boolean array is only applied to that particular, and hence only the values which have true show and the values that are false become uh, not any numbers, okay? So did that make sense? Do you want me to repeat that? Do you want, uh, do you want a summary? Do you want, uh, are you okay with it? Can I go forward? Can I please get a thumbs up for people that uh, understood what was happening? Zere, Ali, Maurice, Oswald, uh, can you please, uh, Maurice, Zere, Oswald, Ali, are you still with us? Yes. Uh, is everything clear? If you want me to repeat, I can repeat oh. something. How did you include W? Oh, so uh, when you, okay, so let's do this again. So when I was, uh, I'm just going to delete uh, this, sorry. Uh, this, this. Okay, so in the beginning, I showed you this data, right? So, but yes. notice that there is, there is no equal to sign here. I'm not saving this. Right. So then I said that let's check which values here are lesser than 2000. So then I ran this command and it gave me this. But whenever I'm running these commands, I'm not saving the output. The output is calculated. It is displayed on the screen, but then it is lost. I cannot go back unless what I do is I save it to a variable. So I say W. Then I say, I remove this, then I say print, or actually I just say W. So W now holds the same thing which you were displaying before, correct? Now what I will do is I will say W lesser than 2000. So when I do this, it only prints out true values where W is lesser than whatever number I put here. Okay, if I reverse this, if I say greater than 2000, then these two values will become false and everything else will become true like this, right? But let's go with the older example. So now when I calculate this again, I'm not saving it to a variable, right? I am just printing it out. So what I want to do is I want to save this output to any variable, let's call it W, or let's call it V. All right, so when I run this, and if I print V now, I will get the output that I was previously getting as well. Now, instead of getting true false, I want to see what are the numbers where things are true or where things have met my criteria, right? So all I have to do is to uh, get this array or get this subset of the table, but only display values where they are true. So just like you pass indexing, this is something called masking. 
So using true and false, you are going to mask the values in this uh, subset and only display the values which are true, right? So what is the name of the subset? W. What is the name of the mask? V. So all I have to do is to do this. If I do W round bracket, uh, oh sorry, square bracket and pass V to it. So V is the mask. V contains true false. W is the original data set which has all the values. So when you pass the mask to the original data set, only the values which are overlaid with true will get printed and everything else will become uh, not any number. Uh, did that make sense? Yes. Thank you. Perfect. All right. So uh, uh, again, what we can then do is just like before, we can do describe. Right. Will this work? Probably not because I probably spelled it wrong. Why is this right? Okay. So when I do describe, those, uh, remember that it only had uh, two values. Both were in the same row, but two different columns, right? So in those, so there is one value per column. So which is why the counts show up as one. There are no values in 1967 because in 1967, it is false, false, false. In 1962, one value is true. In 1957, one value is true. And you will get, uh, all of this, obviously, because now you have uh, not any numbers in your data set, which can also mean infinity values, or it can mean undis undefined numbers. So you cannot calculate all the statistics, right? So for example, you can calculate the mean and the mean of one value will be that value itself, right? So that value is 1353989. And the mean over here is displayed exactly like that, 1709, and you get 1709. And then the minimum value will be the same. The maximum value will be the same. And because min and max are the same value, then there will be no difference at 25%, 50%. They will all be the same value. But note that you cannot calculate standard deviation because uh, there are other kinds of, there are any ends in your data. When there are any ends, uh, then you get problems. If you did not have any ends, so let's suppose, let's change this. So let's suppose that I say, give me all values uh, greater than uh, one. So I know that all values here are greater than one, right? So if I do this and if I check the mask, all values are going to be true. Then if I run this, I will have no problem. I will get three values per column because all three are true. I will be able to calculate mean standard dev, minimum, maximum, and the range in between. No problems there. All right. So I hope everybody was able to follow along. What have we done up till now? We have uh, looked at Panda's library. We have imported data. We have looked at uh, two commands, I lock and lock. We have put in numbers. We have put in the row and column identifiers. Uh, we have extracted subsets of the larger table. We have then started analyzing to find out how many values are greater or smaller than any number. And what you can do is you can apply these kinds of, op you can apply many kinds of operations, but remember that this is just an introductory session. So uh, we are going to stick to very simple stuff. And uh, once we have that, we also chose to use uh, describe to actually look at the stats printed out by our uh, program. So does anybody have any questions up till now? Anything at all? Anything you want me to repeat? Because the next command that we are going to start doing is going to become slightly more complicated. So if you don't understand anything now, please ask me. Otherwise, you might get stuck uh, on the next step. Any problems? Anything at all? Can I get a thumbs up if everything is okay? Oswald, Ali, 
Okay, one thumbs up. Maurice, Maya, Zire. Come on, people, more thumbs up. Okay, I got two. I need a few more. I got three. Two more, please. Maurice, Maya. No. All right. Okay. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, so everything is good so far. So now what we're going to do is uh, right now we calculated the mass, which was that what are the values that are greater than, okay, let me change this back to a bigger number. So we have some meaningful uh, results and let's not do this. Let's do this. All right. So uh, in here, what we are doing is we are creating a mask which looks something like this. And we then use this mask on our uh, subset data to get the values that obey that mask or that follow that mask, right? So I'm just gonna change this back to this, 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 okay? So what are the values smaller than 2000? These two are, what are the actual values? You go back to the original, a subset and fetch it from uh, from there. Okay, so now let's try and create a more complicated uh, mask. All right, so we're not going to use this data anymore. So I'm just going to crop this out. Okay, so data now includes your entire European data set. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm first going to create a mask and show you. Uh, okay, so what you can do is data dot mean. So what does this mean? What it is going to do is that it is going to, for each of the columns that you have in your data, it is going to print out one value which reflects the mean. Okay. So previously, we had one number, the number 2000, and we were saying that here is our subset. It has three rows, three columns. I want you to tell me um, which numbers here are greater than or smaller than 2000. Now we have one mean value for each of the columns in our data. So instead of using one number as a mask, we are going to have a different mask applied to uh, different columns, okay? So how are we going to do that? We are going to do simply data larger than data mean. So you will notice that, uh, okay, so let for ease of convenience, let me just uh, do this and do, why is it down there? I want it, oh, up here, okay, so, what I am going to do now is I'm going to do, uh, so I'm just gonna print out data. So in data in, in, uh, uh, in the column for the year 1952, you have these values. Then I'm going to show you what data dot mean is. So data dot mean for the 1952 column is 5,661, all right? So what we're gonna do is we are going to find out how many values over here in this column are greater than 5,661. Uh, and just as a quick check, we obviously can't compare everything. You will notice that the first value is below and the second value is above. So what we're gonna do now is we are going to do data Data dot. Right, so you will notice that the first value is false. Why? Because your data mean for the column uh, 1952 is 5,661 and the first value is uh, 1,601. The second value is 6,137. The third value is 8,000 and the fourth value is 973. So the mask should be, because I'm looking for values greater than data mean, then this is smaller. So it should be false, true, true, false, 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 true. And if you go down here, 
and read this false, true, true, false, 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 true, right? But remember that uh, it is not the same mean that is applied across. It is, uh, hold on. It is actually the same mean that is being applied uh, across. So, okay, so we'll uh, look at the second column, 1957, which is 6,963. And the first value is false and the next two values are true. So you will notice that the first value is false because obviously 2,000 is lesser than uh, 6,000. And then the next two values are eight, eight and nine, seven, and then it is true. And uh, then it is false and false and false uh, and then true, right? So, um, okay, what have we done? We have applied uh, a larger mask, right? Because each of the columns came up with uh, uh, a separate value, then we were able to use this to apply the mask to uh, those numbers. Does anybody have any questions up till now? Anything at all? Is everything clear? Can I get a thumbs up? All right. Okay. So what we are now going to do is we are going to use this property that we have just explored to answer, uh, to look at a problem. Right, and the problem is stated here. So I don't want you to worry too much about the exact language. Just for example, uh, for instance, let's say we want to have a clearer view on how the European countries split themselves according to their GDP, right? We may have a glance by splitting the low countries, by, by splitting the countries into two groups during the years surveyed those who presented GDP higher than the European average and those who uh, with a lower GDP average, right? So remember that every, when you look at one column, one column represents one year and the entries are each individual country. If you add all of those entries up and divide them by the total number of entries, you get the average GDP for Europe. It might be that one country might have a lot and the other country might be very less, but the average is a central uh, measure. Then you can use that central measure, which is data dot mean for each column to see which countries are above the average and which countries are below the average, right? So by creating a mask, we can solve a data analysis problem like what I have just uh, explained. So now if I say data greater than data dot mean, and if I apply this, then it will create a mask for uh, every country. And it will say that Albania does not meet this criteria for 1952 because Albanian GDP is smaller than the uh, mean for entire Europe. Whereas for Austria, the uh, output is greater and uh, then the data mean or the European GDP mean. So is for Gel Belgium and so on and so forth. Does that make sense? Can I get a few thumbs up if people have understood what we are doing here? If something is not clear, I will be happy to repeat it, uh, but I need to be told to repeat it for me to actually repeat it. So please let me know. Do you want me to repeat or do you want to Okay, I got two thumbs up, so I'm going to uh, carry on. So let's now look at uh, uh, a bit of a trick. So when we, uh, so okay, again, I did not save the mask. So I'm going to uh, save it, creating a variable uh, called mask higher. It is higher because it is applying to many things, but again, the variable name is highly uh, subjective. You can choose to name it whatever. What I want to do now is that this is a mask, right? We saw the shape of the mask before. It looked like true false values, uh, mask higher. But now what I can do is 
that I can add on more things to it because pandas allows me to do that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use a function called aggregate, which is going to apply to this. And then aggregate takes in some inputs uh, to it, right? And one of those inputs is that it will aggregate to make a sum. Uh, now I want to specify how you want to do the summing. If you want to sum on the row versus if you want to sum on the uh, column and both of these are uh, use a different axes. So I will specify that I want to sum it along axis uh, AXIS equals one, right? If I do this, it will tell me that Albania versus Austria versus Belgium versus Bosnia, how many times across the 12 entries was it able to meet the GDP criteria? So again, I calculate the European mean for every year. I then use that mean value to create a mask. Then I find out, so this number Albania equals zero means that across 1952 all the way to 2007, Albania has never met the or crossed the uh, 